Yeah, so we talk about a lot of firsts. We've seen the likes of Ajit Singh carrying the Indian flag in the WWE, but not in, on such level. So, firstly, how does it feel, you know, to be in India knowing that you've carried the WWE Championship, something that no one has done yeah. before? Uh, it's a great feeling. Uh, you know, history was made. I was the 50th ever uh, WWE Champion, first ever Indian Champion. And I was fortunate enough to bring the WWE Championship here to India on my last visit about a month ago. Uh, and what a proud moment that was. And I was looking very forward to defending the WWE Championship here in India, but unfortunately, AJ Styles beat me. But I promise you guys, in the future, I will, will definitely defend that WWE Championship here on Indian soil. But I was very proud of the fact that you know I got to showcase my Indian heritage on such a big scale, you know, with a Punjabi celebration uh, and everything. So uh, it was very, very cool, a uh, great experience. And although I lost it, I will soon become two-time WWE Champion. Right, and uh, you know when I was talking to uh, Singh Brothers. We kind of delved on their past and how their families had to move to the uh, to Canada and how it was emotional for them to come back to India, you know, as WWE superstars. Now you faced, you know, some challenges as well. You worked with WWE, then you got released, then you got signed back. When you were given the second chance, because second chances are very rare in WWE, what went through your mind at that point? Uh, so when I got released, uh, I had a lot of regrets. I felt like I didn't give it 100%. Uh, you know, I became complacent, I became lazy, I got too comfortable. So, and I, I had a lot of regrets. So I thought, you know, if I ever get a second chance in WWE, there's no way that I'm not going to give it 110% every single time. Uh, I'm in the ring every opportunity that I get every single day that I'm with WWE, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, I was fortunate enough WWE signed me back after two years of just uh, competing on my own. Uh, uh, everywhere I went to Japan, Puerto Rico, Europe. I actually even competed here in India with Kali. So, um, Ever since I came back, like every day, 110%. And, you know, I didn't come back and was WWE champion right away. I started at the bottom. You know, I was working like on main event and superstars every week or, you know, working short matches with like Neville or Sami Zayn on Raw or Finn Balor. Um, I was fortunate enough to get drafted to SmackDown in the Superstar Shakeup. And I had got some indication on WrestleMania time that, um, you know, it's going to. You know, change is coming. I thought maybe like uh, Intercontinental Champion or US Champion, but little did I know that, you know, I would be in contention for the WWE Championship, and so it was great. And uh, I continued to work hard. I, you know, uh, when I won the WWE Championship, I worked even harder to be a great champion. I wanted to be a champion for a long time and a multiple time champion, which is exactly my plan. I want to go down in history. Uh, you know, I want to be like Cena, who's a 16 time world champion, Ric Flair, 16 time world champion, Randy Orton, third. 13-time world champion, Triple H, 14-time world champion. My opponent, uh, obviously, this uh, Saturday, December 9th, is Triple H. So I need those big matches. I need uh, competition. Right, and your ascension uh, came in a very short span within the one-year period. But as we know, it's it's uh, often said, started from the bottom, now we're here, and you're yeah. living, breathing example of that. So how hard is it to stay positive once you're released from the WWE knowing that you have these regrets, yet you kept going, but how hard is it to stay positive? Um, it's not hard as long as you have a goal. Right, my goal was to not just come back, but I wanted to be a champion. I didn't hold any championships in WWE in my time because A, I wasn't worthy of the championship, I wasn't working hard enough, I uh, wasn't improving at the rate that I should have been improving. Uh, so basically, I knew what my goal is, and you, goals don't accomplish themselves. You know, you have to work hard at them, and that's what it takes, but uh, it wasn't, getting released, you can take it two ways. You can take it as, I'm gonna get back and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get back, or you know you put on the sad face, boo, poor me, and uh, you know you complain and blame them. You know the writing they didn't, I wasn't in a good storyline or anything. But I took blame for it. You know I accepted the fact that it was my fault. I didn't give it 100%. So why would they give me 100%? Right, and one other thing that a lot of fans particularly found hard was. You know, we had someone like Road Dog Brian James, who constantly tells us he, uh, the wins and losses don't matter in pro wrestling. It's about you know telling a story, performing there every night. Yes. So, do you what do you think of that? I mean, 
do you think the fans buy a little too much into the wins and the losses and all of that instead of focusing on the story uh, on its own? Uh, yeah, I can't say all fans do. There definitely is a portion of them that does uh, get a little bit too involved. You know, my advice is to them, just enjoy it, right? Uh, just sit back and enjoy the, enjoy the show. But everybody has an opinion. And nowadays with social media, everybody has a voice for that, of that opinion, which is okay. You know, nothing wrong with that. That's your opinion. You can stick to it. But storytelling has what's worked for the last 100 years, right. you know, that the, this profession has been alive in more than 100 years. It's the storytelling that sells tickets, not so much that the moves, you know, our gymnastics would be selling out uh, stadiums like WrestleMania sells out. It's not that, it's the storylines, it's, it's the fundamentals, it's a good versus evil uh, that always works and always will work. Right, and uh, you were not always a bad guy. I mean, during your time with Free MD, particularly, the fans were very much into you. Heath Slater and Drew, um, yeah. they started the Don't Hinder Agenda channel at that point. Yeah. Um, so, what went through your mind when the fans actually, you know, they were supporting the bad guys? They were behind you rather than against you. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely cool. I think that's the, the portion of the fans that they like to cheer the guys who they feel are being held down, like someone like Dolph Ziggler or the Zack Ryder. You know, they get the similar we did in 3MB, but it was up to us to make or break. And it, I am the first to admit it was our fault that we did. were not successful. You know, we weren't giving it 100%. Like, if I was as focused back then as I am now, I would be multiple time world champion right now. I would never have been released. I would be sitting here, totally different superstar. So, but in a way, getting released was the best thing that happened to me because uh, I got the much needed kick in the butt, right? I wouldn't, uh, I would have still just been coasting uh, had I not been released, which uh, in WWE you can't do that's a kiss of death or in any sport uh, MMA or cricket or anything you cannot just coast you have to every day you have to wake up hungry every day you have to you know put in the hard work you can't you just can't become complacent or lazy or else you know the decline happens right and the three men obviously prove that you know they can achieve wonders Drew just uh, although he dropped the NXT yeah. he was on fire yes. he won the WWE Championship Heath Slater won the Tag Team Championship so what, what did you just you know have this discussion before that you know we need to get together we need to start working harder what what happened no actually we didn't uh, but I knew that when Drew got released he took it very personally and he had a huge chip on his shoulder he wanted to prove to them that they made a mistake and uh, when he came back on w uh, NXT WWE you know he was a different Drew it wasn't the same Drew that got released in 3MB just like myself, I'm not that same person, neither was Slater. Uh, you know, Slater did the thing with, uh, with Rhino, became tag team champion, but I think even Slater has more to offer than that. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely see that because Slater is, is also focused, he's motivated, and uh, when the right opportunity comes, he's going to shine also. Right, and over the past year, obviously, the Cinderella story unfolded. Um, the Ginderella story. The Ginderella story. How? What was the backstage reaction like when you know superstar saw you achieving what they you know or the fans never thought you would? I think the reaction backstage was it was very well because it showed the boys you know anything is possible. Ginder was there to enhance the other guys to make the other guys look good for years. He was released. And he came back, he was still, he didn't come back as world champion, you know. I, uh, I made my own push, so to speak, right? I made my opportunity. Uh, WWE is a place that they reward hard work and people realized, the rest of the boys realized, hey, if we work hard, you know, doors will open. Stuff starts to happen and it really does. And uh, I th I'd like to think that I uh, motivated the rest of the locker room. Right, and uh, we've also seen on WWE 365 recently about Kevin Owens and Vince McMahon's reaction to his matches. We've seen Sasha Banks doing the same thing. Was there a moment where you walked backstage after winning the title and you just, it hits you, you know, either it's Vince McMahon, either it's Triple H, yeah. comes towards you and says, you've done it. Did that happen for you? Uh, yes, yes, it did. Uh, but I expected it to happen because actually before I was even number one contender or anything like that, I would tell Vince McMahon, hey, I'm telling you, I'm going to run this place one day. And I think Vince likes to hear that. He knew I was motivated. He knew I was hungry. So when I won the championship, when he congratulated me, he gave me a big hug, you know, it wasn't a big shock to me because I had told him this moment is going to happen. And I look forward to, you know, it continue to happen. I, uh, I'm... I still tell them this day, I may not run it yet fully, 
I mean, I'm in the running, but one day this place is going to be mine. And just rewinding that, um, what was your reaction when someone came to you and said, listen, this is when you're going to win the most prestigious title in sports entertainment history? Yeah, I didn't know until that day, but even in WWE, you believe it when it happens because anything can happen. WWE is so unpredictable. Last minute stuff changes, decisions are made. So even though I had found out earlier, I was still, you know, we'll wait till it happens when it happens. And then when it did happen, then it kind of set in. And even it even set into like I was alone in my hotel room when I woke up the next day. Oh my God, whatever. <laughs> What just happened? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's definitely cool. I mean, it's uh, it's overwhelming, uh, but it, it takes a second for it to settle in. Right, because you know the likes of Bruno San Martino, yeah. Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, Steve Austin. It's a lineage that of doesn't course. come easy. No. So at that point, did you feel like you know the, your entire hard work was validated at that one instant when you won the championship? Um, not completely, because. Um, I still have a lot of doubters, you know, and I look forward to proving those doubters wrong. Uh, I remember as a fan, like when someone won the WWE Championship for the first time, I wasn't completely sold on it. Like Chris Jericho, this is speaking when I was just a kid. I mean, Chris Jericho is one of the greatest superstars WWE's ever had. But I remember when he was in that triple threat match against, I think, Rock and Austin. He became the first ever undisputed champion. I was like, oh, what? Chris Jericho? So, uh, you know, it takes some time to be established and be seen as a main event level talent in the WWE Universe's eyes and that, that's what my goal is, you know, I want to become synonymous with WWE just like when you say WWE you think John Cena in the past, you know, you say WWE, you think Ultimate Warrior, you think Undertaker, you know, you think all these great superstars, Bruno San Martino, you know, I want to be synonymous with WWE, that's my goal. Right, and as you said, you worked on main events, dark matches, mm -hmm. you worked your way up. Uh, then in the past year alone, you worked with the likes of Randy Orton, Shinsuke Nakamura, AJ Styles, the top tier superstars in yeah. WWE. Did you foresee all of this happening within just two years after you returned to the company? No, uh, I foreseed it. I foresaw it happening, but not that quickly. I thought, uh, you know, maybe I'll win the IC title, US title first, and you know what? So. As of the new year last year, I started to write down my goals every day. I would write down, become a champion in WWE. I wasn't writing down, become WWE champion. I just wanted to hold a championship. But I should have been writing, become WWE champion. And fortunate, that's what happened. But I look forward to winning all the championships. I want to be IC title, uh, IC champion. I want to be US champion. I want to be tag champion. I want to hold all the championships. Right, and uh, the Singh brothers mentioned that growing up, they looked up to like Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart. Um, obviously, you know, being a Canadian uh, born superstar, you also might have looked up to the, the, you know, those of superstars course. themselves. Who was the one inspiration while growing up that you looked up to and said, one day that's me, that's going to be me? For me, definitely it was Bret Hart. Uh, and then as I got a little bit older, it became The Rock. Just everything from his charisma to his style. Uh, yeah, I wanted to be just like him, right? But definitely growing up, especially Canada, Canada Calgary, I'm from Calgary, Bret Hart, uh, Owen Hart, the whole Hart Foundation. But uh, Bret, just the stories that he told, again, storytelling is more important. Right. Stories that he told, you know, being the smaller underdog, facing guys like Sid, Undertaker, Yokozuna, you know, it was stories that were captivating. Right, and uh, as you mentioned, Triple H was the person that gave you the second chance in WWE. You'll be facing the same opponent uh, on the ninth. Does that give you an incentive to go out and show him what you can do? And you know, not as as an opponent, yeah. but as someone that's grateful for the second uh, opportunity. Of course, of course. Um... I mean, this is a huge, huge match. It's the first time ever I'm stepping in the ring with Triple H, even uh, like touching, uh, even locking up. I've never shared the same ring with Triple H. So this is a big, big match for me. It's a big, big moment. And uh, I have a chip on my shoulder. You know, I got something to prove to Triple H that, you know, he, he said that, you know, he's the measuring stick. He, he's there to ensure that the next generation of WWE superstars are up to par. I look forward to proving to him that I am definitely the future of WWE. Perfect. And as you said, there are some doubters. Now, two months ago, you threw out a challenge for Brock Lesnar. There was this big hype uh, being uh, made between you and Lesnar. When did you realize, or when were you told that that wouldn't be the case? And what was the initial reaction? Did you did you just you know what did what did you feel at that point? 
Uh, I found out the day of, uh, when, we, when we got to Manchester. Um, to be honest, I was a little disappointed. You know, I was looking forward to the match, but I know that match is going to happen sometime in the future, and it's up to me to make sure that it happens, and I'm going to make sure that it happens. Right. And that was that, yeah. Either, there's, like I said earlier, there's two ways you can take it. You can say, you know what, I'm going to make it happen. All right, whatever, I'm going to do what it takes to get there. Or you can, you know, poor me, boo-hoo, I'll blame, you know, someone else. But when it's meant to be, it will be meant to be, it will be, and I'm going to make sure that it becomes. All right, finally, um, as I previously, as you know, you grew up watching the Bret Hearts and the Shawn Michaels. Now there's an entire generation that grew up watching Jinder Mahal as the WWE Champion. What does that mean for you personally, and what are your intentions going for? What's next for Jinder Mahal to accomplish? Yeah, no, it's a great feeling and um, it's something that I take very seriously because all of my actions, you know, especially with social media nowadays and everything's under a microscope and not only do I represent me, I represent my family, I represent my heritage, I represent India, ultimately I represent WWE and I want to be a positive role model, you know, to the youth and especially I want to be a... Uh, um, an inspiration to them, just like I had my role models inspiring me, guys like Brad Sean, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, <clears throat> and even like when I was in high school, Randy Orton and John Cena, they were already main event level stars, you know, I looked up to them, and to share the same ring with them, you know, maybe I'll share the same ring with, a, with uh, someone who, who looked up to me, so that's definitely a cool feeling, it's not something I take lightly, and uh, you know, that's what motivates me, that's what makes me give 100% every day, it's knowing that my actions are affecting, you know, thou potentially thousands of people, thousands of the youth and uh, the direction of, of their lives and I want to uh, be the best, best role model that I can be. All right. Anyone want to pause to know? Do you yeah. want to share any... Sorry? No, go ahead. Yeah. Any uh, funny road stories because that, that keeps happening in WWE, obviously. Anything that's just, that just pops into your mind? Uh, yeah, one time me and Braun Strowman were riding together in the middle of North Dakota where there's nothing. Uh, we hit a deer. <laughs> and the deer broke the radiator so we couldn't drive the car any further. And we have no cell phone service. Uh, but luckily the other guys were coming behind us and we like flagged him down uh, on the side of the road. Uh, he jumped in with Charlotte, who barely had any room in a car, and I jumped in with Gallows and Anderson. And, and fi I just left the keys under the mat. Finally, when I got service, I called the car rental company and said, hey, the car is parked between this town and this town, the keys under the mat. Uh, come and take it. Luckily, I had insurance. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was that. Well, that's, a, that's a funny, funny story. We just basically just ditched the car on the side of the road. And, yeah, for, for, luckily there were other people coming or you know, we would have uh, <laughs> maybe had to spend the night there. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Jinder. Thank you.